So these things keep on getting better. But so let's oh, yeah. take into account all these kinds of procedures. We've got the FUE, which is the gold standard for hair transplants. That's the most common one, the, the one that works best. Then you have the Regenera, the stem cell one. Then you have the PRP, and then you got the TED. And you're, what you're saying is you like to combine a lot of these together, right? Absolutely. Even if where, you where, where, back like, where, where does the TED fit into this? Let's say somebody does a Regenera. Let, I'm assuming when you combine these things together, they're also the, the costs are also going up quite a lot when you combine four different treatments. Right. Here's the thing. Obviously, nobody joins a gym and does every exercise in every machine uh, on the first day. Let's just back up a little bit. Before you jump into a gym with a trainer or without, you've got to figure out what are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? And that's where the evaluation really starts to kick in. And so when someone connects with me either virtually, as we're doing today on a video call, or in person in the office, we dissect into what is the medical history? What is the hair loss history? What are the lifestyle risk factors that are affecting the hair follicle? Do we need to do any kind of testing like DNA testing to look at metabolic pathways that might be affecting the hair? Are you nutritionally deficient? Are you lacking sleep? Are you totally stressed out? Before you embark on a hair restoration journey, you've got to really take a step back and look at the whole picture. I love talking about the technology, regenerative medicine and TED and growth factors and peptides. Those are awesome. But if you don't take care of, for example, just the soil in the garden, right? If you have itchy inflamed scalp, all of these treatments, none of these treatments are going to work that well. And so let's right. get down to the business of figuring out what are the risk factors that are affecting your hair. If you're a middle-aged woman and you're going through hormonal changes, perimenopause or menopause, you may be noticing some changes in your skin and your hair, in the hair texture, hair color, hair curl. Even just the quality of your hair might be changing. You might be noticing that your eyebrows are changing with time. Is that indicative of a hormonal imbalance? We got to go from the big part, big view first, that 10,000 foot view, and then get down into, okay, what kind of measurements and tools are we going to use to evaluate your situation? We're going to click a photo with an AI powered microscope to look at the back of the scalp versus the front or the thinning zone. We want to get an idea of what you're noticing. Are you noticing ex excessive shedding or is it a receding hairline or is it a bald spot that's growing? Obviously, if you needed a hair transplant, we don't start off with some biotin. We're talking about restoring some hair into that area. But you still have to protect the other hair. And so I'm sure your surgeon recommended to you, look, the transplanted hair is permanent, but your other hair is not. And so that's how we build the treatment. Some patients like the idea, and you asked specifically TED versus PRP. As we said, PRP is local anesthetic. It's a blood draw. It's once a year. Powerful. We've got over 13,000 TED treatment or uh, PRP treatment complete. TED is relatively new. Even though the technology has been available, this is something that came out only about three or four years ago. And so we don't have double-blind, randomized clinical mm. trials. We have a few pilot studies. Uh, but patients like the idea of not having to be stuck with a needle. And so that's where the TED comes into play. Also, TED requires four treatments, once a month for four months. So that's a repetitive treatment. Now, you either got to fly in for that or you got to be down the block or far away from us here in Boca to have that kind of treatment typically. So those are risks and benefits and costs and benefits, if you will, of the various therapies and treatments. But, what about um, Regenera versus PRP? If you had to pick one, which one would it be? So Regenera is, in my hands, Regenera is a PRP treatment, right? Because as I said, uh, PRP is the vehicle that we use to apply mm -hmm. the Regenera. We don't just apply Regenera in a little bit of saline. That makes no sense to me. Let's put the Regenera in the powerful PRP process. And the reason why this is important, and, and I think maybe some of my colleagues are a little bit behind on the, the technology of regenerative medicine. I've been a part of regenerative medicine in that field for a long time. In fact, I was literally in the first class uh, of certification in the American Academy of Anti-Aging when they did a stem cell fellowship. I was in the first class the first year they did it. I think it was 2009. But the point is that in the world of regenerative medicine, you have cells, signals, and scaffold. And so everything that we do in the world of regenerative medicine falls into one of those three categories or more, right? So for example, PRP, platelet-rich plasma, the platelets are the cells, the signals are the growth factors that are released, but where's the scaffold portion? And so what we've learned is that using a scaffold, a scaffold is something either biologic or synthetic that you can combine with the PRP, you get a stronger and longer effect. 
And so that's where the Regenera comes in. The Regenera not just gives you some stem cells from the hair follicle, but it also gives you this biologic material that the scalp and the hair follicles are going to work with. And so that's the scaffold part of it. And very often we'll use perinatal biologics. So it could be placental tissue, Wharton's jelly from umbilical cord. Years and years ago, we used to use pork bladder, believe it or not. That was called A-cell. And there's still some of my colleagues using A-cell out there. It was a great healing treatment. But I guess the point is that those types of things need to all work together to get the best possible result in a regenerative medicine treatment. Same goes true for you know, whether you're doing in orthopedics or in skin. For many years, we used to do a small lipo aspirate, which is basically a mini liposuction to get the fat cells to create a stem cell therapy for hair regrowth. So that could also yeah. be in that mix. I got you. Okay, that makes sense. I want to present my you know, uh, dilettante research on hair loss and see if you have any feedback on that because I use that those basics to then guide and how I can cover all these bases to prevent hair loss. And this is pretty off the cuff, so let's see how I do on it. But basically, as I understand it, hair loss is from a lack of ATP, so energy production in the scalp, right? It's a lack of blood flow, so it could be oxygen or nutrients, a lack of growth factors, DHT, and DHT could cause some of these issues here, but it could also be independent. And then, so there's, and then like inflammation and oxidative stress, essentially. Is there anything else that I think, well, so is there anything else besides that? Yeah, I mean, correct? I really would. I think maybe we need to do something a little bit different. What I would suggest, and certainly increasing blood flow and enhancing uh, cellular metabolism and increasing ATP production are all methods to improve hair growth. I wouldn't say necessarily that patients with male pattern hair loss have poor blood flow because having operated on tens of thousands of patients, I can say that's not the case. They do bleed and sometimes a lot, to be honest. And so we have to take particular care and do particular types of treatments to actually minimize the oozing and the bleeding if you want a successful hair transplant. So mm -hmm. I think we, I would approach it a little bit differently. I would look at the genetic risks first. Male or female pattern hair loss runs through the families. Let's look at your family tree. If you're not going to do a DNA analysis right away, let's look at the family picnic then and see who's out there with hair loss. The biologic relatives on mom's side or dad's side could have an influence. And we know for male pattern hair loss, DHT, dihydrotestosterone, which is made from testosterone, is the primary trigger. How do we know that? We know that because if you lower DHT through pharmaceutical intervention, you can basically the progression of hair loss like nine out of 10 times. That's a pretty good rate of success. Now, some people do have sexual side effects from doing that, but again, it's only probably less than 2% of patients and those are mild and reversible if they occur. Now, the other modalities or the other metabolic pathways that you mentioned, like ATP production, certainly mitochondria dysfunction is really critical as we continue to age because we know that hair can change. Even the more permanent hair on the sides and the back of the scalp can change color, it can change texture, and it can change in caliber as we enter into our older years. And so is it cellular senescence, which can be hopefully mitigated by a number of different factors? Is it energy production like ATP? Certainly if we apply treatments, for example, like photobiomodulation or what we used to call low-level laser light therapy, red light therapy, we can increase ATP production in the scalp and that will help hair growth. I think you're on the right track. I just would flip it around and look at the, look at those primary causes first and then apply those pathways that you mentioned in, in categorizing treatment modalities.